semifinals of uh, uh, this uh, four days uh, virtual uh, conference uh, that STPI is organizing our annual uh, conference. Uh, uh, and uh, this session is uh, again, uh, I would say one of uh, the uh, important session because we are talking of uh, uh, evidences, something that we keep on doing on a regular basis uh, and something that uh, government uh, using on regular basis and something that my uh, very learned and eminent uh, panelists here, they keep on uh, supporting uh, to do. And we just want to triangulate and try to see that uh, whether the evidences produced through uh, research, whether uh, the research products, uh, they uh, first they get uh, hurt at some places, but uh, uh, we have been discussing it with the, the uh, public sector representatives and uh, uh, government decision makers uh, during last uh, three days. Uh, today, we want to uh, have a discussion uh, with the development partners uh, in country and wanted to know that uh, uh, what is their uh, perspective on uh, these evidences, whether uh, it's uh, demand driven, whether uh, it is uh, these evidences, they are supply driven. Uh, and if you uh, then uh, link it with the uh, uh, COVID-19, I think uh, the situation, uh, the jigsaw puzzle, it becomes even broader. And that is uh, that for COVID-19, we never had a baseline. We never had a set of standard evidences. Uh, none of us in our lifetime, we had uh, uh, observed or witnessed uh, uh, such pandemic. And now while evidences, they are gathering uh, from phase one to uh, what we are calling uh, phase two. And in some countries, perhaps uh, there was uh, uh, no uh, distinction between phase one and uh, phase two. Uh, so uh, where those evidences are being used, uh, uh, how important are those evidences for uh, uh, your uh, development uh, uh, assistance uh, partnerships or country assistant uh, partnerships uh, that uh, uh, were the panelists here, uh, they have uh, 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 defined already whether these evidences, they are uh, helping you to amend uh, those partnerships. And uh, so these are the type of uh, questions we'll be asking in this very interactive uh, session. Uh, but I can see my colleague Ahmed uh, uh, there. Ahmed, if you can give me a quick housekeeping announcement, uh, uh, brief intro of the panelists, and then I'll kickstart the discussion. Your mic is off, Ahmed. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Um, Thank you all the panelists for uh, making uh, it today and, and spending time for this. Um, of course, um, first of all, we have uh, Her Excellency Ms. Wendy Gilmore, uh, Canada's High Commissioner to Pakistan. And thank you very much for sparing the time. Um, your office has been very cordial in emails exchanging and then they've, they've, they've been very cooperative. Um, then we have Mr. Michael Nehrbas, who is from the USAID, he is the deputy country ahead. So thank you very much. Um, followed by <clears throat> uh, Umar Ikhlaq Malik Sahab of United Nations Development Program. He's a policy analyst. So thank you very much. I think my throat's caught up. Yes. So uh, we have Mr. Richard Og from FCDO um, who represents the macro stability team. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, so, so a couple of uh, housekeeping announcements that uh, throughout the uh, session, I would request all of you to please uh, continue to show your video. And especially if you're talking, we would really like to have your video so we can tweet and upload that on social media. Um, I think Dr. Uh, from my side, I think that would be it. Um, each speaker, I think we can give them 12 to 15 uh, minutes, of course, starting from my presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, do it in a conversation, uh, Matthew. So let's uh, not uh, go in uh, lecture mode. I think uh, if we remain uh, interactive, that would be So I'll have a couple of rounds of questions uh, and uh, we'll listen to them and then we'll try to generate a discussion uh, among uh, the panelists uh, here. Uh, uh, we will not be able to take live questions from the uh, participants, but uh, when we'll come towards question answers, I'll request you to post your question on chat box and uh, we'll pick uh, those uh, questions uh, from uh, the chat box. Uh, now, as I said, that uh, 
uh, we are talking of evidences, we are talking of uh, research products, we are talking of uh, uh, something that works or something that uh, doesn't work. We're talking of baselines. Uh, now, uh, the first thing that we uh, wanted to uh, know, and uh, I'll uh, come to uh, Richard, if I can start uh, from you uh, first, from FCDO. So it's in a very random order, no, in no particular order, but I wanted to start with uh, FCDO. Uh, Richard, uh, what type of uh, evidences uh, are uh, now available and uh, relevant for uh, FCDO? Uh, FCDO uh, has been uh, working with government of Pakistan on COVID-19 on uh, other development uh, program. So do you think that we have uh, enough body of evidences uh, to uh, educate and to uh, guide and whether FCDO requires such evidences at all? Thank you, Dr. Abid. Um, yeah, I hope you can all hear me. Great. Um, yeah, so I mean, 2020, what a year. It's really uh, turned a lot of things on its head. I think, uh, I, you know, I think back to January when you know, we were seeing what was happening in China with COVID-19 and, and the response, um, but it hadn't quite sort of caught in other countries to the way that it, it later did go on. And I remember having a conversation with our public health experts within uh, you know, what was formerly DFID, now FCDO, uh, and he was saying, you know, this COVID-19 uh, that's going on in China, it looks like it's gonna be really big and it could have global implications. We should probably sit down and do a thought piece about what the implications of COVID-19 might be for Pakistan and our work here. And I remember thinking, and you know, I was aware of COVID-19 like everyone else. Um, and I, you know, I got his reasoning and his logic, um, but there was definitely something in there which was like, well, yes, it sounds like a nice idea, but actually I've got a list of the usual tasks that I have to do, the list of the other things. Maybe I'll get to that one later. And of course, as things uh, transpired, uh, you know, COVID-19 had the last laugh with all of us on this, right? Because it did, to, whether, you, whether you wanted it to acknowledge it or not, it had a massive impact globally. And, uh, you know, the, the evolution throughout the year of how we've started to, to work together, whereas before, you know, my job as a senior economist is to work on the economy and economic reforms, social economic reforms. Um, and you kind of think, well, public health, that's for the public health experts. Now, there's no question that you work together now because everything has a trade-off, has an implication and all the rest. So three areas I would like to uh, mention, particularly of being new evidence that I think has come in since we left the old normal, uh, sort of pre-COVID, to what is the new normal that we, we now unfortunately have. And the first one is evidence work that we've been um, uh, seeing from organizations like SERP, the International Growth Center, uh, down with Punjab where they've been helping the Punjab gov government think through some of the trade-offs. Um, and so it's not just sort of, you know, particularly in the first wave where there were quite uh, significant lockdowns, um, thinking through what the trade-offs are between livelihoods, uh, public health, um, education, all the other things there. And how can you make sure that that evidence gets through to the policymakers at the provincial government? And of course, hopefully as well at the federal government as well. And so they had some quite good early success uh, on that, and it's great that they were doing that. Um, we also, of course, have seen the, the wonderful work that Dr. Abid, you've been doing yourself with SDPI, uh, with uh, supporting the Pakistan government on things like food security. I will we'll talk a little bit more about that one later, I'm sure. Um, but also, I think, you know, seeing how the multilaterals have been responding as well to evidence, the, the Asian Development Bank, the World, uh, the World Bank, uh, business pulse surveys, rapidly getting out there, testing the temperature with businesses, how are things going? There was a lovely uh, bit of evidence that, uh, that was commissioned by the World Bank earlier uh, over the uh, over June, July time, uh, Rafay Khan and uh, Amjad Bashir. There's some great work interviewing 1,500 firms in Pakistan uh, and looking at so what the impact had been. And at that point, uh, which was probably going back towards May time, so 51% of uh, businesses were temporarily closed during that time, 9% of them were permanently closed. Uh, and you start being able to benchmark and say, well, okay, this is really starting to have substantial impact. Of course, you know, the lockdowns, that was by the nature of it. But then starting to look at some of the positives as well within this, and that shift towards digital platforms, knowing that from the evidence that they looked at, 54% of companies were uh, increasing their use of digital platforms for doing business uh, and operations and for sales. 20% were investing more in digitalization. So you start getting a sense as to how... COVID-19 and the impact of it might start shaping the new, the new world as we come out of uh, the crisis. 
Um, so, so I'll pause there. But I mean, it's it's been a it's been a fascinating year for us as we've had to grapple quite quickly with the the, the new demands of the job and the new evidence that's required. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, Michael, if I can come to uh, you, uh, you have said uh, again uh, one of the users of uh, evidences. Uh, now, uh, with this uh, COVID-19, do you think uh, the landscape of uh, evidence production in Pakistan, uh, did it uh, help you at all or were you more relying on uh, international evidences? Because uh, in this uh, whole discussion of evidence, uh, one question that keeps on uh, uh, disturbing and that uh, keep, keeps on under discussion, uh, who's producing which evidences and which evidences are more, whose evidences are more reliable? Uh, whether uh, you give weightage to all sort of evidences, uh, the same kind of weightage. Uh, so if I can uh, get your take on it. All right, uh, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, fantastic. Um, very well. Um, in, in, well, first let me, uh, let me start by saying uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Suleri, and, and uh, uh, good morning and assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for this great opportunity to uh, join this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Um, when it comes to evidence, uh, I would say we've, we've used a, a mixture of evidence, but uh, let, let me start out at a, a bit of a higher level. Um, I think we can agree that 2020 has been a challenging year. Um, this pandemic has forever changed us. Every corner of the world has suffered from the loss of millions of people to this dreadful disease. And uh, closer to uh, today's discussion, uh, the world's economy also has suffered with millions out of work, kids not in school, businesses struggling to survive or, or flat out going broke, going out of business. And many of us are struggling with the uncertainty of knowing how our lives will be impacted and for how long. Here in Pakistan, the response to the pandemic illustrated how the partnership between our countries can help mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Since 2015, the US government has supported the government of Pakistan's preparedness planning and response readiness for diseases of public health importance as part of global health security. This joint investment laid the foundation for early detection and rapid response to the pandemic. Our assistance did not stop during the pandemic. For example, USAID has continued to train farmers, women business owners, and others to sustain their incomes and revenues in a pandemic impacted world. We've promoted agricultural technologies through virtual demonstrations via radio broadcasts that reached 3 million listeners and created awareness for youth empowerment and livelihoods through Kisan World Magazine, reaching more than 30,000 readers. USAID also worked with the private sector to develop new business practices based on digital platforms. Through a partnership with Food Panda, USAID worked with home-based chefs from across Pakistan to enroll in weekly online training with Food Panda marketing experts. As a result, bakers, lunch service providers and other small food businesses and improve their pricing strategies, market segmentation, and basic digital marketing practices. This intervention helped many businesses keep going despite the pandemic. Since the beginning of this pandemic, the United States government has provided $39.5 million in additional funding to address the primary and secondary impacts of COVID-19. This investment in our partnership with Pakistan is really an investment in global health security because this virus does not recognize any border. When it comes to pandemics, we're all in this together. What you may not know is that 75% of the US investment in Pakistan's public health sector, or $29.5 million, is managed by USAID. And this has resulted in the donation of 200 US made ventilators the training of thousands of healthcare workers and the refurbishment of health clinics across the country. Additionally, USAID helped Pakistan establish disease surveillance and response units at the district level and launch a mobile application 
Both of these interventions facilitated the work of hundreds of surveillance officers and response teams to track the spread of COVID-19 and other diseases. Looking over the horizon, I'm sure I'm not the only one who is looking at 2021 with tremendous optimism and hope. I'm done with 2020. With the promise of new vaccines being distributed to millions of people, our work is rightly placed on the rejuvenation of the economy, strengthening infrastructure, getting children back to school, and applying lessons learned to improve prevention, detection, and readiness to respond to the next outbreak of disease. Right now, the United States is working with the government of Pakistan to support COVID-19 response efforts across the country. We need to continue leveraging public and private sector resources to mitigate rising poverty and chronic hunger by financing and scaling up innovations in small and medium-sized enterprises in agriculture and food security. Yes, we uh, also need to continue. Me, uh, Michael, if, if I can, uh, sorry, if I can uh, uh, just to stop you here. I'm so, sorry to interrupt you. Please. Uh, all the things that USAID is doing, but again, if I go back to my basic questions, uh, what sort of uh, evidences are we uh, using uh, to uh, do it? Either it's a, a demand side evidence uh, or it was a supply side. So uh, whether uh, USAID is doing it because on a mega scale, on a larger scale throughout the world where uh, USAID is uh, working, uh, you are getting uh, a demand for this type of things or uh, you are using some of uh, the policy recommendations and some of the evidences that are being produced in Pakistan. So, and then the final. Sure, okay. Well, when it comes to um, specific uh, planning, strategic planning with regards to uh, COVID-19, USAID recently conducted a, a strategic planning exercise called Over the Horizon. And that's basically to prepare for a world that's been altered by COVID-19 and uh, now has an increasingly complex humanitarian and development landscapes. So USA technical experts in Washington, D.C. And, and also in the field basically interviewed stakeholders and reviewed different data sources as part of this scenario planning exercise. And in this analysis, uh, USA used global data to establish three strategic objectives that focus assistance on addressing uh, pressing challenges um, made worse by COVID-19. So these are building more stable and resilient systems, responding to rising poverty, food insecurity, and lost education uh, opportunities, and finally strengthening strained public and private health systems and health security. And the findings of this planning exercise basically underscored that USAID has to exercise leadership and equip ourselves to be agile and to prepare for heightened uncertainty. Um, when well, it comes thank, thank to I the impact- this round, But this round, it's very important okay. and heartening to uh, know, I'll come okay. to you in the second round, but it's very heartening to know the type of evidences that you are using. So uh, the three dimensions that you mentioned and. Uh, that, uh, of course, uh, from a mega data uh, and the mega evidences that you were using and uh, you are replicating uh, the responses in Pakistan, which are uh, extremely uh, uh, appreciated and uh, very useful. Uh, in the second round, I'll again come to you and we will uh, get to know uh, a bit more uh, about uh, USAID's uh, support towards uh, Pakistan and how uh, USAID is strengthening Pakistan's response. Uh, just to set the scene, if I can go to uh, Excellency uh, Ms. Uh, Gilmore, and uh, again, uh, uh, Canadian government, I'm uh, sure, uh, is working on uh, collecting some uh, evidences. Uh, IDRC Canada, one of uh, the uh, research organization, they are quite uh, active on uh, evidence generation and uh, evidence uh, creation, uh, their support as well as dissemination. So has this COVID-19 uh, impacted uh, some of uh, the things that uh, Canadian partnership are those evidences they are uh, proving helpful to you? Thank you very much, uh, Abbott, and hello to all my panelists, uh, my co-panelists, and 
the uh, participants online this morning. It's it's a really good question um, because uh, we we believe in the Canadian government, and I think the donor community writ large that all of our interventions should be evidence based, and and that means first and foremost having access to as comprehensive and reliable data as possible. Sometimes collecting that data can be truly challenging, and uh, and ensuring that it is applied in a way that's meaningful. Um, so just, just to, and, and I, I, I will address the question directly rather than a more general statement, but one of the things that, that we have been doing here in Pakistan and, and frankly working with others and our partners on is looking specifically at evidence that supports gender-based analysis. As, as I'm sure everybody knows, Canada has a feminist international assistance policy. We, we are focused primarily on addressing the significant needs of women and girls here in Pakistan. And we have a number of flagship programs that we're doing that we have retooled in part to try and accommodate the very changed circumstances that COVID have brought this year. Um, so in fact, just last week, uh, I was lucky enough to participate in the launch of a population analysis situation report that Canada provided with others support uh, to UNFPA who worked with the, um, the Ministry of Planning, Development and Special Initiatives to prepare really a comprehensive report that looked at a number of key development areas as they relate to Pakistan's demographics. So environment, climate change, um, in particular, uh, reproductive health, uh, the economic context that informs those uh, health related decisions, gender and inequalities and so forth. And that population study drew on existing data sets in Pakistan, particularly the demographic health survey that was conducted last year, a multi-indicator cluster survey, and the 2019 maternal mortality survey. So this type of data applied against a demographic, a population analysis lens, is going to inform the type of interventions that we would hope to make in the health sector, education sector, and some of our more general um, uh, not general, but, but uh, gender specific programming moving forward. The other thing that we, we are doing, we have two flagship programs that are underway. One we, we refer to as Women's Voice and Leadership and the implementing partner is Oxfam. They have as part of that program, baseline data connect collection related to women's advocacy and women's organizations, grassroots organizations who are um, the closer people are to the community, the evidence demonstrates that the more effective some of those interventions can be. They need to take place in a systemic framework where the services are available. But the other program we have is our Women's Political Participation Program, where we're working with partners such as uh, IFAS, the International Federation of Electoral Services, Shirkat Dao, SAP PK, South Asia Partnership PK, and where we are looking explicitly at um, uh, retooling some of our programming, as I said earlier, to accommodate COVID. So, so they have conducted studies as part of their particular initiatives that collects the data on how COVID is, Im is impacting some of the things that we're doing, which is everything, it's, it's a soup to nuts political participation from uh, registration of women getting access to their um, scenic cards, which of course on a COVID lens then act allows the, the poorer segments of society to access some of the programs this government has put into place like SAS and others. But it's also how do we encourage women to start engaging in organized political activity, political parties, um, uh, the type of advocacy to try and engage on issues with the political parties, getting women candidates. Um, so we've just in fact uh, concluded some of our efforts that were supportive of the Gilgit Baltistan electoral process to look at how do we engage with the women candidates that were part of lists? How do we ensure that they are looking at some of the available data on women's participation to then factor those issues into their political platforms. Um, so it, it's, it's really, I guess, at the core, my answer to the question is, we need the baseline data to inform our decision making. Some of these studies are already underway as part of the pa government of Pakistan, we can support that. Some of the data we have to work with our partners to collect ourselves. I would say just as my one thought, maybe put it out to the panelists, is that we have real challenges in Pakistan, as in many developing countries, getting access to good data, to collecting that data and to analyzing it, which is complicated in part by a lot of the time the data is collected by civil society organizations. And in Pakistan, civil society is 
challenged by the very convoluted and um, I would say antiquated registration process, which requires varying levels of permission from different parts of the government in order to actually get out and collect the data. I'll stop there for now. Thank you, uh, Wendy, for uh, highlighting uh, data needs. Uh, and if I come to uh, Omar, Omar, uh, of course, uh, your uh, uh, commissioning uh, UNDP is a major development partner. You are not only uh, commissioning uh, this evidence collection, but you again uh, go to bilateral and multilateral uh, development partners uh, for uh, uh, highlighting the needs uh, for uh, data and uh, research so that uh, they can keep on supporting UNDP. So uh, do you see uh, any uh, particular uh, increase in demand uh, from decision makers in public sector for the evidences uh, and uh, demand from bilaterals uh, uh, during this uh, COVID? So any shift in demand or it's business as usual at UNDP? Thank you, thank you, Abid, uh, and I really appreciate, like you know, coming after what what Wendy said in terms of the data landscape in Pakistan. Like you know, when the COVID nineteen uh, started, like you know, I'm talking about March when when it started having an impact in Pakistan. The planning commission in itself uh, started thinking about, like you know, while the government was doing a health response to COVID nineteen, they wanted to have a look at the socioeconomic impact of COVID nineteen, uh, like you know, to, on the lives and livelihoods of the people. And back then, like, you know, with the support of the RC office, we started this analysis on COVID-19 socioeconomic impact and response plan for Pakistan. Uh, similarly, we are doing this National Human Development Report. This will be sub subsequently launched uh, early next year. Again, we have a chapter on COVID-19 and its impact on Pakistan's economy, so social and economic life, and also on inequality. The biggest challenge, and that's where I come to what Wendy said, was the ready, readily available data. In terms of Pakistan, like, you know, if you see the data landscape, one thing I agree, like, you know, you, for, for such a comprehensive analysis, you need large data sets, like, like you know, in Pakistan, Wendy mentioned a few, like PSLMS, MIX, a PDHS. Like, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, for these analysis that I'm talking about in terms of COVID-19 socioeconomic response plan and the, uh, uh, the National Human Development Report, we did not have nationally disaggregated data sets covering these COVID-19 durations. The PSLM I'm talking about, the last was done in 2014 and 15. PDHS and labor force survey did come recently, but they were prior to COVID-19. And they also had limitations in terms of reporting at the national and the provincial level. So in that context, relying on national surveys to frequently produce such analysis and data becomes challenging. I think these surveys cannot happen like you know in, at a short notice. So th there is a challenge there. And hence, like, you know, the suggestion to use more digital based technologies to, to get, uh, like, you know, at least anecdotal evidences to such data sets is something that uh, the government should think upon. In terms of available data set for COVID-19, the Planning Commission has done, uh, sorry, Pakistan Bureau of Statistics has done a comprehensive survey on socioeconomic impact of COVID-19. The results are anticipated. Our last discussion with PBS was in, they would be coming out in the last week of December but those are still awaited. There is an increase in demand coming to your question in terms of uh, like, you know, evidences for COVID-19 response because both the development partners, the UN organizations and the government need evidence to program uh, like, you know, themselves according to the needs of COVID-19. We did this analysis on socioeconomic uh, uh, COVID-19 impact and we realized employment, engagement, uh, uh, generating jobs, protecting livelihoods were some of the key pillars. But these were based on, again, like, you know, either uh, the past data sets or anecdotal evidences that we found from some surveys with different stakeholders has done based on, like, you know, but there, there were limitations in terms of uh, uh, the size, sample size, geographical locations. So indeed, I think there is a need and a greater demand for ready-made or quick uh, analysis. And I think digital transformation using digital realm would be one solution in that context. Relying purely on government in terms of producing survey data would not uh, at least serve the purpose. They would, but but still, like you know, there would be limitations. So that's it to my response. I will add a bit more detail when you ask question number four on digital transformation and give examples in the global domain. But I think I've, uh, if, if uh, the response to your question is uh, sufficient. Well, uh, thank you. I'll uh, start my uh, second round uh, from. Uh, uh, Michael, but uh, before that, uh, uh, I will uh, 
I request uh, my colleague Ahmed Khaber. Uh, SGPI as an evidence producer. So the reason I uh, uh, deliberately uh, altered this uh, order uh, that uh, he has about uh, two or three slides uh, uh, that he wants to uh, uh, produce. So uh, just want to see that whether we are working in silos or uh, there is some uh, connection between uh, what is being said by evidence uh, uh, supporters and uh, evidence users vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the think tank. Uh, uh, so Ahmed, uh, if you can uh, share your screen, uh, uh, I just need you to uh, come to this uh, policy recommendation and conclusion uh, slides, uh, not more than uh, two or three. Uh, and uh, quickly tell us that uh, uh, you heard uh, four uh, perspectives uh, from four major uh, development partners in uh, Pakistan. So what does your research tell us, whether you endorse uh, these uh, views or do you have uh, something different to uh, say? Ahmed. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Saab. So um, in light of what has uh, been said, I think I will come to what we've been able to do for the past six months, the interventions that we've made in the program called Strengthening the Use of Evidence for Development Impact. Um, we've had a series of stakeholder dialogues uh, where we had um, policymakers and the private sector uh, come together and talk about different uh, uh, topics on the same subject and essentially producing evidence, uh, not producing evidence, just brokering evidence, providing that access to evidence to both the stakeholders so that they can collectively design their way forward. So, uh, so but, but what do we think, what does uh, that exercise tell us? that there are some things that still need to be done on top of, of, of what we have been able to do. We've been able to develop an advisory board within the government. We've been able to develop MOUs with the government. We've been able to uh, uh, get some of uh, the ideas where there is a capacity deficit. Uh, but when we talk about what more needs to be done, uh, of course, the private space, the private sector has its own deficiencies. The up-to-date evidence which we expected from the private sector to bring to the table, uh, in most of the cases, it was lacking from their side as well. Um, number one, we, we need to look into the reasons for that deficit in the private space as well. Uh, the second thing is uh, the female participation within the stakeholder dialogue series. We, we found that they, they thought of these policy engagements as having less value. Of course, we have to look into why, why is that? Where does this come from, notion come from? So evidence producer and evidence users are working separately. We, we came across both evidence demand and uh, the, the evidence producers. However, there's a lack of the platform where both of them can, then, then both of them can come and connect and, 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 and exchange ideas and views and opinions. Uh, of course, this is another thing that we need to look into that why is this uh, gap still there? What interventions do we need to design to look into these? Uh, the, the fourth thing is, while we broker evidence, while we connect or link the, the, the private sector and the public sector, uh, especially in the trade and commerce space for what we did the stakeholder dialogue engagement, there is still need to go beyond uh, the, the, this uh, intervention and try and trace that where this evidence actually goes to, we discuss it with some of the officials in the government or people from the private sector, but we need to go beyond that and trace that, how actually that information goes into the policy making pro process itself. So, so that of course has to be done if, if there is more openness from the public sector, but these are the couple of things, uh, a few of the things that we found that um, after doing our intervention, still that needs to be done. Yeah, thank you for covering very, very useful uh, points and uh, uh, somehow it uh, echoes uh, what uh, Wendy mentioned, what uh, Umar uh, mentioned, and uh, what uh, our uh, panelists uh, mentioned. Uh, A, access uh, uh, to data. B, uh, this uh, lack of uh, capacity even in private sector. Uh, C, uh, lack of uh, gender data, gender segregated data, even if data is available, gender segregated data is uh, uh, not there. And uh, that would bring me to uh, my uh, second round of uh, question. Uh, uh, Michael, I will uh, uh, come to you. Uh, uh, if uh, I can uh, give you a little background of my uh, question. So uh, for this uh, four days uh, sustainable development conference, we are having uh, different panels. And one of the panels uh, last night was on uh, 
COVID healthcare, uh, where uh, it was uh, brought uh, uh, quite clearly uh, that Pakistan uh, uh, did require uh, and uh, uh, does require uh, these oxygenated beds and uh, ventilators. Uh, but uh, uh, most importantly, it is uh, the uh, paramedical staff who could operate those ventilators. And uh, the case uh, which was uh, highlighted that uh, even in uh, the state of art uh, hospitals like uh, PIMS, uh, there is a shortage of uh, uh, paramedical staff who could uh, actually operate uh, uh, the ventilators or who could operate uh, those oxygenated uh, beds. So uh, uh, when I ask you the question about supply driven intervention or demand driven intervention, so that's what uh, where uh, I would uh, like to get your opinion. Uh, that uh, is there a mechanism in this, we know uh, when we are in pandemic, we have to deal with urgent versus uh, important. So there are certain things which are urgent, where, which require a knee-jerk response. And there are certain things which are important and uh, there can always be an argument that perhaps uh, urg urgency in such cases, uh, it uh, uh, take uh, priority. Uh, but I, I wanted to uh, you, uh, ask this question to you and then to rest of uh, the panelists that, uh, uh, either you have a mechanism in uh, your organization where you could make a balance between urgent and important and you keep on doing your mid-course correction while you are doing your excellent uh, support to uh, Pakistan. Over to you, Michael. All right, thank you very much. Um, in, in terms of uh, USA's engagement, we have a, uh, a health strengthening mechanism where in the case of uh, providing ventilators before we actually rolled out uh, those ventilators, we did a rapid uh, review uh, working closely with the, the provincial ministries of health and NDMA uh, to look at the facilities, to, to look to see whether they had the capabilities and uh, other necessary items to support that type of uh, technology. And only then did we uh, provide them the uh, ventilators. I think it's very important um, when you're making a response that you do it based on knowledge. Uh, you can't, you can, you can waste a lot of uh, time, effort and resources uh, by doing things without sufficient information. So uh, that really characterized how we uh, provided ventilators. And then that uh, also uh, resulted in the follow-on training. Um, but I, I, I wanna emphasize while ventilators are, are important for very critical patients, uh, even more important is providing training to staff for surveillance and response. And that has been done across Pakistan. And, and that's really critical to enable the government to uh, identify and uh, manage its resources and where it needs to focus. Thank you, Michael. And a supplementary question, if I may ask, uh, I'm sure you are using some progress markers or you are uh, using some uh, uh, milestones to uh, do some uh, mid-course assessment of uh, uh, your interventions. Uh, so what kind of uh, evidences are you uh, getting uh, so far, uh, the last 10 months engagement uh, with government of Pakistan on COVID, if you would like to share with us? Thank you very much for that question. It's, it's a great one. We have gone back to the facilities that were assessed to see uh, how they are using the ventilators and, and how much and that has varied according to the amount of infection in, in the areas. Um, the type of, of follow-up uh, examinations is, is really crucial uh, to enable us to, to carry out what we like to call adaptive management. Because again, uh, unless you're responding to a real demand, if you've already trained up, for instance, in an area, and you go back to it and you see there's no problems, but in another area, you see the technicians didn't quite absorb what they needed. You, you have to go back and, and manage your, your, your training resources accordingly. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, if I can uh, uh, come to you. And uh, again, uh, uh, this whole question of uh, follow-ups and uh, some progress markers, uh, what is it that is helping you to do some mid-course correction? 
uh, your engagement with government of Pakistan during last 10, 11 months, especially on COVID-19? I think one of the things that we have found the most helpful is the improved donor coordination that's uh, that's happened since the uh, the start of the um, I don't know, can we still call it a crisis after 10 months after the pandemic? Um, the World Bank had taken the leadership to bring the donors together on a weekly call. And, uh, and I certainly have found that incredibly helpful. It's uh, an opportunity to exchange information on the pandemic itself, but also what each of the donors are doing. And, and that's helped us look at our existing programming, retool. It's also identified some of the gaps, which we've been able to go back and find some additional funding for. So, um, uh, for example, food security has emerged as a fairly significant issue in the last couple of months. We've been able to secure, and I believe it's a, Chris will tell me if I'm wrong, but a, a million dollars additional funding for the World Food Program and their programs here in, in Pakistan. So it, it, it really is the, the uh, you know, as I say, the, the data has been evolving over time. Certainly our understanding of the pandemic and its impacts have been evolving over time, but how each one of the donor community is addressing it and then being able to be as, you know, given the constraints of all of our funding models, as flexible as possible in, in identifying and responding to what the government has, has, uh, has themselves identified as their needs. Uh, thank you. Uh, Richard, I'm uh, coming to you. And, uh, you know, uh, one of uh, the demands that they keep on propping up, it's about uh, dealing with the mental stress, especially uh, mental stress for, uh, uh, the women and girl child and uh, only last week uh, uh, when while we were uh, uh, throughout the uh, world were commemorating this uh, 10 days of action uh, uh, two weeks of uh, action shadow pandemic uh, against gender based violence so uh, do you uh, have have you uh, got any of the evidences uh, that uh, fcdo uh, should work on uh, this mental how to cope with this mental stress uh, the mental uh, uh, needs, emotional needs of the patients? Is it already part of uh, FCDO programs or are you getting any demands to start work? Thank you, Dr. Abid. Um, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating question. I think it's one where all around the world we're grappling with this now, right? Because with COVID-19, unparalleled pressures have been put on, on people from the mental health side of things. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it, it's, it's definitely a question which is worth asking of ourselves of, you know, to what extent can we help and support in this? Because we are starting to see, uh, whether uh, anecdotally or from more sy uh, systematic evidence, that these, these are big issues for these, these crisis times. Um, you know, so I, and I think gender-based violence, as you referred to earlier as well, is, is, is a common issue that's come up across different countries as well. So, you know, the, on the UK side, there is a, a, a strong, uh, you know, women empowerment, uh, um, uh, action against violence against women, and, and sort of, uh, the, the whole stream of important gender issues are a real uh, important thrust of our partnership with Pakistan uh, and what we're, what, what, what we're doing here. Um, so, um, you know, I, 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 I think it's definitely the right question to be asking about, you know, what more could or should we be doing on these areas and what more we can do within the existing programs that that we've got and the existing areas where we're doing we're, you know if we're working on the health side you know a, a, a great example of how we've had to pivot and adjust during these times is if you think before covid of course we didn't have any covid interventions but when the crisis hits you have to look at what you've got and you have to see right how can we adjust how can we adapt to make it helpful and useful for you know, what is not just urgent, but often these are urgent and important things that need a response. So the work through the polio network that my health colleagues were doing adapted and became the network from which uh, the COVID response started to, 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 to happen and the wonderful important information from the communities on the ground that could come through that. And I think the same sort of thinking is required on the mental health side from us, right? It's the question of, you know, how much is this, a, is this um, uh, an immediate thing which is going to uh, be less of an, uh, which is really put on by the pressures, but is going to be back to the normal levels, as bad as they were afterwards, and how much of this is something which is actually uh, here to stay. And we, but either way, it's an important issue for us, and I think it's a valid question that we should all be asking. Thank you. Uh, our uh, UNDP uh, 
um, does a lot of engagement with the public sector, with the key decision makers. Uh, do you uh, getting any increased demand of uh, data and evidence from our uh, key decision makers uh, where UNDP is uh, working, for example, the Planning Commission and COC uh, and uh, many other uh, uh, public sector organizations uh, with uh, whom you are working. So is there any appetite for evidence? Uh, are they asking for uh, data, for some evidences, some policy, research-based policy recommendation on the basis of which they can tailor their uh, uh, programs, interventions? Are they just happy with the money that comes from FCDO or USAID or Canadians that, okay, some money is coming and we will Uh, your mic is off. Sorry, my apologies. My apologies. Uh, so I think Abhi, this is a very pertinent question. But but before answering this, I think the landscape between data producer and data user is not like, you know, that there is one data producer and one data user. I think like, you know, from development partners perspective, we are both data producers and data users. From the government side as well, the government is both data producer and the government is both data user. But what I foresee, like what I see now is that I think government is also on the path of using evidence-based analysis. I think from the development policy unit perspective within UNDP, we have been pushing for this agenda through our national human development reports, the HDI index that we produce, the multidimensional poverty index report that we produce, that there is a need for evidence-based policy making. You cannot continue spending your resources the way you do historically. You need to look into the data. Is it within our provinces? Is it Balochistan that need more uh, more allocation of resources or more strategic policy making for the government from the government or is it maybe a district in Punjab, Lahore or K like you know a more developed district in that context? What are the needs of the people and then which sectors of the economy you need to invest? Is it agriculture, industry, services? So I believe gradually the government has got into this understanding as well that there need there is a need for evidence based planning. And for this, I think uh, a big credit goes to the planning commission that they've like, you know, started taking ownership of the data, the way like, you know, they adopted multidimensional poverty index as an alternate means of measuring data, the partnerships they are having with uh, UNICEF in terms of uh, undertaking mix uh, at all the provincial level. So I think there is, there is an appetite within the government on evidence-based planning. And they are using much of this uh, on on like you know how to allocate resources the other day i was surprised to receive a call from one of the departments in punjab i think it was the transport department and they asked like you know when is the next mpi coming for pakistan i said like you know we are planning this on the basis of receive, uh, release of pslm but he said like you know we are waiting for it to use it in terms of allocating our resources to the various districts of punjab to build road infrastructure like, you know, we want to see which districts are doing well on MPI and which are not doing well on MPI so that we can expend more resources in districts that are not doing well. So I think there is an increased realization within the government to use data uh, and evidences for uh, like not only resource allocation, but also uh, policy making. Thank you, Omar. Uh, quite heartening to know. Uh, Michael, if I can uh, come to you, and I know USAID uh, has always uh, remained an active partner for uh, public health sector uh, support. Uh, so, uh, do you think uh, uh, Pakistan uh, was, uh, of course, no country was uh, prepared, but some of the interventions that we had already uh, done uh, in Pakistan on this public health sector, uh, if those were not there, uh, what could have been uh, the current status of our response, health, health sector response to COVID? Uh, and uh, how far you uh, feel that uh, your uh, this uh, program, uh, it enabled us uh, to uh, respond uh, to COVID uh, uh, in a proper and better manner? Great question. Um, I, I have to say that uh, Pakistan in many ways was, was better prepared than other countries in the region. For instance, uh, the US government had invested in uh, building up uh, along with other donors, uh, its system of laboratories. Uh, so in, in a way, uh, by having that capacity in laboratories, um, Pakistan was, was poised to be able to, to react much better than some of the other countries in the region. And if, if I may, I, I, I would also argue that 
Pakistan was uh, poised. If, if we go beyond uh, the health sector, if we look at uh, like the government of Pakistan's Benazir Income Support Program, uh, the fact that you, you already had a means to um, provide uh, cash transfer to the poor uh, really positioned uh, Pakistan and also other donors to come together and su to support Pakistan in, in terms of the, the huge impact that this pandemic had on the most vulnerable. Um, so in that way, I, I would also argue that um, the fact that you had a program that was supported by several donors and, and also that, that relies on uh, data uh, for the, the implementation and management of that program, uh, Pakistan was well prepared. Uh, Richard, if I bring the same question to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo what Michael said on terms of like having some of the, the aspects of the ASALS program with this. You know, when, when the crisis hits, you have the kind of mechanisms in place, which are, uh, you know, to roll out support for uh, some of the most vulnerable during, during those times. And I think having, um, you know, it's like I said earlier about the polo, uh, the, a polio network that you can repurpose. Um, having a, a, a social transfer system that can be adapted and can be used and leveraged um, is, is incredibly important. So in many respects, Pakistan was um, quite well placed to, to, to deal with this um, you know, global pandemic. Um, and, I, I, and I think the more, you know, from a lot of this, we talk about evidence and uh, how that meets with policymakers. I think a lot of it is about how the evidence producers respond themselves, right? So I think one of the things that was quite interesting in the early stages of the pandemic um, was, you, you know, it, there are a host of elements, right, of when partners get traction with government and policymakers. And I think, you know, PIDE were very good at the early stages of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the crisis with their sort of, you know, almost like daily update and dashboard that they had, which was sort of giving an update on the situation and how things were evolving. And that was great, but, you know, because there are a host of policymakers being able to see that. I think SDPI have been fantastic by having these really trusted relationships with government and being able to sort of um, really, um, you know, when when there was a need to get evidence in front of them, like uh, Dr. Abid, the work you've been doing on food security, you know, you've been able to help them work together because that trust and collaboration was already there. You've been able to help them to, to, to use evidence more uh, substantially in those areas. So I think there's something about sort of being, you know, being from the evidence generating side, being able to produce relevant evidence rapidly, having those trusted partnerships. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, and also having the systems like, which you can repurpose within place, which Pakistan has had many of them, which have been helpful for this, have all been quite, quite helpful. And I think we're, you know, the ability from those who are demanding evidence or those who are receiving evidence to, to, to take note of that and to inform their decisions is, is of course crucial. And I think we've seen that to varying degrees in the different areas, but it's certainly, you know, it's something that all countries have been struggling with. Uh, yes, and that brings uh, uh, me to uh, you, uh, Wendy. Uh, no, uh, Canadian government is uh, working on this uh, uh, feminist international assistance uh, policy. And uh, one of the uh, lacuna that we have seen uh, in our evidences is lack of gender segregated uh, data. So is there any uh, intervention from uh, your side so far whereby you could uh, uh, strengthen uh, this uh, collection of uh, gendered uh, evidences and gender data? Would you like to share with us, please? That's a very good question and, uh, and thank you very much. I mean, frankly, it's not just gender that you need uh, disaggregated data for when you're looking at policymaking. It's also the various socioeconomic strata. It is the uh, ethnic um, and other minorities that needs to be, to be desegregated to understand how policy decisions impact different communities differently. Um, in, in Canada, we employ something called, I think I mentioned earlier, the GBA plus, gender-based analysis plus, which is really a requirement that we have in presenting policy decisions to government or policy options to government for decisions is to include specific um, assessment on the policies impact on different communities. 
and uh, and that's I mean it's as as those of us who are bureaucrats and and responsible for providing policy advice in any of our organizations that can be a very challenging task because the evidence isn't necessarily always there and collecting it is difficult if the data sets themselves don't start out with a disaggregated lens as part of their collection effort. Um, so knowing that doesn't necessarily make it very easy to change mid course. Um, we have, as I said earlier, as part of our programming, um, very specific policies that are designed to address the needs of women and girls, and they have baseline data collection built into them. Um, it's uh, the advocacy that we do, and I know that many of my colleagues, the, the, the donors that are around this particular panel do as well, when we are engaging with government here in Pakistan and our other, our other uh, partner governments around the world, is encouraging that data set to make sure that the lens is included. I mean, something that, that uh, I was very struck by in popular media over the course of the last 24 hours, as the initial COVID vaccines are being rolled out around the world, it's very clear that the initial trials that were done to determine their safety did not include um, women of uh, childbearing age. And that's a very standard problem with a lot of drug-related trials because of the prospective very catastrophic impact if the drugs are turn out to be contraindicated for women that are pregnant. But the result is that we have a fairly significant segment of the population for whom we have no data, no reliable health related data to know if, that, uh, if, if the relevant safety protocols have been met. And so the, the, you know, the instruction for the first vaccine that's done in Canada is that pregnant women should not have the vaccine. Well, I mean, that's, that's um, erring certainly on the side of, of caution, but wouldn't it be great if we could actually structure drug-related trials to include some of these underserviced populations? So that, that's a long way about answering your question. We look at uh, the data needs relating to gender and hopefully also disaggregated demographic data and population-related data every time we do our programming, but it's a challenge and frankly, funding is limited. And so choices have to be made on where the, the data is, is collected, where the programming goes. But it's something that I would really encourage all of us to keep in mind as these programs are being developed. Uh, thank you. Uh, coming towards this uh, semi-final round of uh, today's discussion, uh, let's focus on some of our strengths, some of the success stories. Uh, uh, Omar, if I uh, come to uh, uh, you, and if I can uh, start you. So are there any uh, success stories uh, that you can uh, share with us uh, with regard to various evidence, uh, ecosystem strengthening, uh, convening, connecting evidence producer and user, uh, creating demand for evidence, uh, capacity development for evidence use, et cetera, in the times of uh, COVID-19? I have a very pertinent question over here. Uh, I think Pakistan, I'm just talking about Pakistan and then I'll, I'll take a dig at the global aspect as well. I think Pakistan has done well this time during COVID-19 in terms of using the existing data landscape and try to shape up its policy response during COVID-19. One, if you recall, like, you know, when the COVID-19 actually happened by, by, I think, March, April, the government was already like, you know, once they decided with the complete lockdown and were trying to open up, they start with smart uh, tracking and tracing of geographical areas. And this was very comprehensively done based on a very thorough, thorough set of data sets that were available using space technologies, using the reporting of uh, COVID-19 cases. I think Pakistan did relatively well. And I think this was globally appreciated as well in terms of Pakistan's response to COVID-19. The second intervention I would like to refer is the uh, BISP, uh, uh, the SRS Emergency Cash Transfer Program. Again, like you know, we immediately went into using uh, digital realms, more more uh, available technology, to uh, like you know to identify those who are vulnerable. And again, like you know, using the existing data, but also using other other means, like you know, the data available with Nadra and other stakeholders to identify who the vulnerable would be. So in that context, I think Pakistan has done well in terms of using quick data or uh, big data sources for for shaping up their policy response during COVID nineteen. But having said that, I think there is more that needs to be done. This, this, like, you know, COVID-19 provided us an opportunity to think beyond the box. 
we were in, like you know from the very beginning while like you know as you know we we at UNDP do policy research and we have been relying much on on published data that comes from the surveys but i think the government has also started realizing that there is a need to generate data more frequently and in doing so they would need to rely on on digital realms the work that dr sania is doing at bisp is thought provoking the work that uh, i believe like you know you would know uh, there's a lot of work that development partners are working with nadra and other stakeholders on child registration and vital statistics again they are trying to use digital technology to start reporting so i think there's a big appetite for it and it is good to see post covid 19 that there would be more ownership openness from the government to start using digital data a lot of countries in the world have started doing this we in our context at undp established an sdg tech lab with support from our uh, sister agency unfpa to use space space technology to see how we can monitor and report on sdgs so like you know i think there is there is a gradual opening up we can use uh, digital technology space technology to report on a lot of indicators maybe green green cover on crop production data uh, slums identification so like you know there is there is a need to place in more efforts but covid 19 has opened the doors so it is a door opener in that context if if to look at covid 19 from a positive lens uh, thank you. Uh, Michael, if I can come to you and uh, ask uh, from you some of the success stories that USAID has uh, uh, observed uh, uh, regarding this uh, evidence use, evidence connectivity, uh, or uh, capacity building uh, for use of uh, these evidence at uh, implementation level. Sure, sure. No. Um, we, we certainly did react to uh, data about the plight of small businesses in Pakistan. And I, I already mentioned our, our partnership with Food Panda. Um, I, I, I would also like to add that uh, in a similar fashion, uh, we also uh, reacted to the need for uh, a, a safe way to get health consultation. So we partnered with Instacare, a Lahore-based uh, e-commerce marketplace for health service providers. And uh, we were able to uh, work with them to provide a, a free online uh, consultation through its Instacare Corona Response Unit. So patients basically could uh, discuss their symptoms with doctors from their homes. Um, and USA provided Instacare with business development support uh, for its digital marketing and website development. So I, I think. Um, much of our successes really relate to recognizing what we could do online in the digital space. And I, I also mentioned we, we worked online with uh, farmers uh, in the government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa to uh, launch a, a, a telefarming advisory services, um, which was very useful for uh, spreading agricultural technologies and, and products. Um, Richard mentioned how how the government uh, uh, with donor support has been able to successfully uh, pivot uh, its its uh, polio um, support, and I, I think uh, that type of pivoting is is a success. Um, I I will note uh, as uh, data driven organizations, I I think we're all seeing that uh, polio rates are are going up and. And uh, you know that's that's uh, an example where we're we're going to have to pivot back and start focusing uh, some of our our time and energy on uh, polio. But I I think that type of pivoting, that type of adaptive management, is so important in this type of pandemic. Uh, thank you, Michael. And uh, what I uh, gathered from both of uh, your responses, from Omar as well as uh, from you, uh, it's uh, about uh, the power of uh, digitalization and digital transformation that is improving uh, our evidence generation, evidence dissemination, and uh, evidence brokering uh, powers. Uh, Richard, if I bring the same question to you, uh, any success story from FCDO that you would like to highlight here uh, about uh, use, uh, production, brokering, dissemination of uh, uh, evidences? And Yes, uh, I, I mean, I think there's been quite a few successes really in terms of changes to all our ways of working and how evidence in, in, informs that. Um, you know, if I think back to how we positioned ourselves within organizations, you know, I'm an economist, uh, you know, we, 
the the idea that if you asked me a year ago, would I be engaging on health issues to the extent that I have been over the past, uh, tw- you know, over the course of 2020, uh, I would have been very surprised to have heard that. But I think what this crisis has done is it's forced us all to think very multidisciplinary, uh, you know, think very multidisciplinary in, in our approach because we need to have that expertise from different angles, different sides, in order to come together with a with a coherent policy. Uh, our global chief economist, Rachel Glenister, uh, you know, has been fantastic at, at showing leadership on this within our organization, right? So, you know, I've had um, meetings with her in the past year where it's been exclusively about health issues. And she's, she's adjusted her approach to, the, you know, as that chief economist to be able to work out where her space within this new order is and make sure that evidence, good evidence is feeding into those processes and those decisions that are being made. Um, another really useful thing that's happened is that they, uh, through the Chief Economist Network within our organization, they've been able to disseminate the information, the global evidence, as it's been coming through. So every week, you get an email through which tells you what the relevant information from country X, country Y is, and you can start thinking through what that implication is for Pakistan uh, and others. So I think within our organization, that's been a very useful uh, adjustment that we've had. I think more broadly, you know, I think what we're saying with you, you know, your, your conference at the moment, with webinars, I mean, I don't know about everyone else, but I, you know, the, the, a day doesn't go by where I have invitations to various webinars on different topics, right? And whilst it can be almost overload by the number of webinars we're all invited to, it's, it's actually quite, um, it's, it's quite dem- democratizing in a way that, and opening things up and meritocratic because you, you, you know, you, you, you mentioned Dr. Abbott at the start of the, 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 the event that you, you know, by having this as an online thing, you're able to attract people that otherwise wouldn't have been able to attend the SDPI conference. And I think that's very true. And I think we're finding that you can get expertise, participation from all sorts of areas that wouldn't have happened before. A couple of examples that I've seen very successfully done, uh, you know, we, we were able to, through our support through the World Bank, help facilitate the Pakistan Customs Service to uh, Pakistan customs officials uh, to to start speaking to Brazilian custom officials about risk-based um, approaches and what they're doing. You know, before that could have happened, it would probably have been like some sort of study tour. It probably would have taken months and months to sort of set up. Um, you know, it probably would have been very expensive. It wasn't at all, and it could happen very quickly because everyone has started to adjust to the new ways of of, of working, and those cross-country lessons were able to be shared. So, um, and I think there's another aspect as well to this as well, which is you know, the various biases that we have in the way that we do our meetings, the way that we hold our events and all the rest of it. I think, you know, the rules of the game changed overnight uh, when lockdowns happened. And I think you see people engaging in different ways. And there may be some people who are more introverted, who find that they are more comfortable putting things on the chat than they would have been if they were speaking up in the forum. And they participate more now because of the fact they have more options and how they do that. Um, There's a whole host of ways in which you get different dynamics coming through, some of which can be very positive, although, of course, there are negative sides to that as well. The final point I would say about the positive on this is that I think there's something which is, um, you know, from the international side, a bit humbling here, where, you know, you often, um, often the prejudice is that, uh, you know, Pakistan must learn from others and others cannot learn from Pakistan, which is absolutely false. And I think with this pandemic, what we've seen a lot of in that is that actually there's some very important lesson learning from from Pakistan, um, some of which in a very positive sense, and some of which which is just very different to how the pandemic has played out in other countries, which actually it's really globally important to understand. Why did the virus behave in Pakistan in the way it did compared to say how it could how it how it happened in India? Getting to the bottom of that, you know, many people, you know, I'm sure we all have our theories, our speculation, but really trying to bottom out what that why that that happened that way is so important for us globally to think through how we respond to to future pandemics and um, and what what just happened. So I um, I think you know as, as as horrible a year as it's been, there's definitely been a so a number of positives in terms of the evidence side and how that informs policy making. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. I'll uh, bring the same question to Wendy, but uh, let me also pose you uh, the last question so that all four of you you are uh, prepared enough. Uh, uh, and that is, uh, uh, I know, as a uh, child, all of us, we had this fantasy to uh, be in a time machine, go back, uh, and then redo it. So if all four of you uh, are given this opportunity to be in a time machine, uh, go back a few years uh, back, and uh, uh, you are asked to redo some of your interventions, 
uh, that USAID and FCDO and Canadian High Commission and UNDP had been doing. Uh, what is it that you would like to redo to uh, create more resilience and more bouncing back uh, capacities uh, in the countries where you are working? So uh, you can think on it, but uh, uh, Wendy, uh, let's uh, focus on success stories, uh, for the last question for this round, and then we'll uh, start the journey of uh, being in uh, this time machine. <laughs> I'm thinking of my time machine. I think the, the one thing I would tell both uh, all of my staff and partners is take your vacations in February. Don't wait until the flights close. Uh, but it is a, it's a very good question because <clears throat> I mean, we, we have the benefit of hindsight. Uh, and frankly, this is likely not to be the only global pandemic. I mean, if, if anything we, we have understood is that the, uh, the uncertainty in expectation and the, the speed with which um, issues become global, whether they hurt health or others, is at a point now that is truly unprecedented in history. And so we've got to learn our lessons and be prepared for the next one. But the success stories are, are interesting. I, mean, I, I think uh, Richard had identified a number of the ones that I would have, uh, have also cited, chiefly amongst it, our familiarity and willingness to use electronic platforms to exchange data, to engage with one another, to, to transcend geographic and time zone barriers. Um, and, uh, and let's hope that that continues, if nothing else for our environmental uh, um, objectives moving forward. If we can use electronic means to lower our global carbon footprint, that works to all of our advantage, as well as it does to the ability to connect up otherwise audiences and, uh, and exchanges of information that wouldn't have happened in, in a non-electronic format. Um, I mean, one of the things I know, I think we have online someone from uh, Aga Khan University, which is brilliant down in Karachi. Um, I know that, uh, that a program that Canada has uh, access and, and its successor health programs link up expertise in various healthcare fields with uh, isolated and rural communities, particularly in northern Pakistan, in, in Gilgit, Baltistan, and Chitral. Um, we, uh, the, the, what's called C consultations, I'm not sure what the C stands for, but I'm sure it's online something to ensure that experts can connect. So tertiary facilities can connect with primary and secondary facilities in a way that wasn't otherwise possible. The lesson we learned from that is that connectivity matters and underserviced areas are at a disadvantage in this pandemic. So getting a reliable access to the internet getting access to broadband, um, you know, more bandwidth up into rural areas is the way that they are going to be able to harness this new energy, this new electronic energy and move forward. Absolutely critical. Um, monitoring of COVID patients has happened remotely in real time. Dealing with infection control measures to try and prevent the uh, need to for multiple access to patients who are under quarantine has been a, a lesson that's learned and now employed in a number of healthcare facilities. Um, the other thing that's, I think, interesting to cite is some of the, the, uh, the impetus to develop home-based entrepreneurs, to access digital platforms, to allow new entrants into business, especially for non-traditional entrants. You know, in Pakistan, unfortunately, uh, a lot of women are confined to the home sphere, to physical home space in a way that is not the case in other countries and in other developing countries. Um, so by uh, allowing access to digital means and frankly increasing the number of devices that are with women and girls is allowing new entrepreneurship opportunities. And that's something we absolutely have to carry on because the isolation felt, the segregation felt by some women in, in Pakistan is not going to go away with the end of the pandemic We've got to find a way to connect them to Pakistan's economy and to start to encourage uh, in ways that, uh, that are not going to engender backlash, start to encourage more active participation in the, the broader economy. So I would stop there. And, uh, um, but, but really, I think the, uh, the la well, actually one more thing, I'm sorry, I wanted to say is that the directly relevant to this panel, hopefully, there is an increased understanding amongst the general population for evidence-based decision-making. And in particular, for the leadership shown by our experts. Expertise matters. 
the countries that have allowed their policies to be informed by experts have done better than those that haven't. So public health experts taking leadership roles, providing the evidence, providing the data sets on open platforms for everyone to try and understand is hopefully what we as consumers are now going to be used to. We want to, you know, we want to see the money, we want to see the numbers and to be able to understand them in such a way that it informs our acceptance of public policy. So hopefully that will continue. Thanks very much. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Michael, if I can come to you, are you ready to uh, be in the time machine, use your hindsight? What is it that the uh, US said uh, would have done differently uh, to turn more resilience and more bouncing back capacity uh, in Pakistan? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, if we could magically go back in time, it, it would be wonderful to start on disease surveillance units and rapid response earlier uh, with, with the focus on, on human capacity early on. Um, you know, and there's machines like ventilators have gotten a lot of attention, a lot of press and, um, and that's all well and good. But I, I, I think we've also learned during this pandemic that the provision of oxygen uh, can be provided in, in a variety of means. And it would have been good to uh, uh, look at other things early on uh, had we been able to uh, see what's coming. And, and also just understanding uh, the strength of uh, Pakistan's uh, laboratories uh, its laboratory network early on, I think would have been immensely useful in terms of how we uh, programmed our, our resources. And, and then finally, I, I think uh, it would have been great to, uh, to start the donor coordination, uh, which has, uh, as Wendy noted, greatly improved. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's often uh, in response to uh, circumstances that, that such things uh, emerge, but if I could make it happen earlier, I would have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, Richard, uh, the same question to you. And uh, uh, I think you can also relate it with the fact that uh, just before pandemic, uh, uh, UK after United States was declared as one of the most prepared nations for any pandemic. Uh, so. Uh, going back in time, uh, what is it that perhaps uh, uh, FCOD uh, could have done differently? Or your predecessor, DFID, could have done uh, differently uh, to build more resilience in the countries that you are engaged with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, Wendy and Michael have given some really good answers on this already. So I will, I will support everything they've said and build on that. Um, I think, you know, just one reflection well, two reflections, really. One that harks back to what I said earlier, really, which is, you know, it really matters uh, to have built partnerships in all different strands that can, you know, that are that are quite solid partnerships before the sort of pandemics or, or the big shock it is. You know, it's the Mike Tyson quote, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. And I think with this pandemic, we've all globally been punched in the face and we've had to adjust. And I think what we've seen in terms of resilience and coping mechanisms is that, you know, area, programmatically, areas have been able to still deliver on their work where they've had strong partnerships in place, where it's been easy for them to pick up the phone and call a partner, um, WhatsApp or email or whatever. And those sort of the trust and the collaboration is already there. I think there's also a lesson programmatically for all uh, international donors uh, around um, how we build flexibility into our programs. Because, of course, I think in uh, you know, usually the pressures are all around, you know, what's your results framework look like? What's your, you know, very targeted, condensed uh, work planning look like and all the rest of it. And of course, that's fine if everything goes to plan A. But if you have to adapt, having space within all of that, that you can flex and you can adjust and course correct is, is crucial. Uh, so those are the two reflections I would uh, add on to what's already been said. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and uh, Wendy, of course, uh, one of the wishes uh, like you, I would also like to go back on my vacations early February. But besides that, uh, what is it uh, that uh, uh, Canadian uh, High Commission, IDRC, and all other development agencies, they could have done differently uh, to build more resilience and bouncing back capacity in Pakistan? 
And I, I can only echo Richard in that the flexibility in our programming. We, we, have, we have exercised whatever creativity we could. I've got wonderful colleagues in the development section here at the High Commission and our, our counterparts back in Ottawa at finding the space in our existing programming tools to respond to uh, the pandemic. Um, and in particular, a lot of our programming, in fact, the vast majority of it being directed at civil society organizations, um, it's, it's ensuring them flowing through that flexibility for their own programming and needs and looking to find opportunities to advance the overall goals of the existing programs by using the, the challenge provided by the pandemic. Um, the, uh, <laughs> if anything, you know, understanding the, our own bureaucratic processes for approvals um, and trying to find expedited ways to move new programming through the process has also been a huge challenge for us. And so um, if anything, there's an impetus for our decision makers to, to uh, you know, on the one hand, our accountability requirements, the governance requirements to make good sound decisions. And on the other hand, the real uh, requirement to disperse monies quickly to respond to a crisis situation. So, you know, again, I'm, I, I can only hope that we will learn those lessons and be able to apply them, but uh, it would have been very nice to have a bit more responsiveness into the system on an earlier basis. But it's, uh, yeah, we, we, we can't go back, but we can get ready for the next one. Let's, let's hope we learn the right lessons. That is the, the crucial piece. Thank you. Uh, Omar, uh, you are the last one. To... Thank you. Uh, my time machine, like, you know, is working purely on the question of like, you know, COVID and data related initiatives. I think one thing that going like, you know, back in the time, I think we need to invest a bit more in terms of how we can generate data more digitally rather than through traditional norms. I think that's an investment that like, you know, we, we should have made a couple of years ago, maybe, uh, and, and like, you know, it's something that we should do now, realizing that these, like, you know, this is a, not the last pandemic that would hit, hit the world. There would be crises coming in in time in future, and we should be fully prepared uh, to, to have our response plan uh, in place and the sort of like you know what Richard and Wendy is talking in terms of having our uh, like you know working modality uh, having our programs more more open or flexible in that context would come only if we have ready-made data available like you know once this crisis hit if we go to the ground getting da data available I think that would like you know wouldn't make our programs that flexible because it would take a couple of like it will take a lot of time to generate that data, to generate that evidence, and then have our program respond to it. So I believe the critical investment that needs to be made, or we should have made, like you know, going back in the time, I think would be to, uh, like you know, to invest more on generating data and evidence as readily as we can. So I think that that's something that investment that should have been made, or we plan, we should plan to make in times to come. Thank you. Uh, we uh, still have three minutes left. Uh, uh, can I ask you for your final pointers? Uh, one minute each, uh, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, my final point is I, I, I believe that donors, uh, non-governmental organizations, government, we all really need to join forces and uh, achieve the kind of critical mass in order to gather sufficient data and respond to uh, a crisis like a pandemic. Thank you. Wendy, final minute. I think we're, we're all uh, somewhat inspired to, uh, to you know, follow the data, make our decisions based on data. That's, that goes without saying. I think one of the things that we could do as donors perhaps is better coordinate our data collection so that we're not duplicating each other's efforts. I'm not saying that we are necessarily, but there might need to be a, a very specific effort to look at where the gaps are in data and maybe divide up some of these efforts. And frankly, I, I would just use my, my 10 seconds left, Abbott, by saying thank you very much to SPDI. I think you and your organization play an incredibly important leadership role in Pakistan. 
with respect to evidence-based policymaking. So uh, I'd, I'd say keep it up and, and well done to you and, and thank you very much to you and your colleagues. Thank you, Wendy. Umar? Uh, parting, like, you know, uh, Abed, I'm a very positive person. I think while, while the world is grappling COVID-19, I think it has opened up new opportunities, like, you know, not just only in terms of our response to such crises, also to help us think more strategically in terms of like, you know, sustainable development and also to adopt to new technologies. I think we should continue with the same spirit irrespective of whether the crises come or not, but try to be more open to new ideas and be forthcoming and like, you know, have some foresight into how the world is transforming and try to adopt to new technologies. I think COVID-19 has given us that opportunity. The government has responded to it. The civil society has responded to it. Development partners have responded to it. Each one in their own domain has like, you know, done their bits in terms of opening up, being open to new ideas and new initiative. I think we should continue in the same vein and keep us hoping for a better world coming forward. Richard? Yeah, I, I think for, for me, one of the key take homes from the last year in terms of the evidence side of things is the importance of that ecosystem and the diversity of that ecosystem in terms of how evidence is, is generated. Because I think what we've seen is through this crisis, there's been an important role that international evidence can play. There's also been an important role uh, that locally placed evidence can, can play as well. And I think one of Pakistan's real strengths is the diversity in that. I mean, I know we've, we've said about some of the lack of data for some of the things that we've uh, been talking about earlier. But I think on the flip side of that, there are some very strong research institutions uh, in Pakistan, like SDPI, um, and it's been really helpful as part of the ecosystem to be able to tap into uh, institutions like yourselves and others uh, when we've needed those to answer those specific types of questions. Uh, so that ecosystem is really important and we need to keep it going into the future. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, all of uh, uh, the distinguished panelists for joining us for your uh, very candid answers. Uh, very open uh, to uh, my questions. Uh, I won't uh, take much time in summarizing, but uh, I think there are three uh, important takeaways for me. Uh, one is uh, about uh, this whole landscape of uh, 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 data producers, data users. So all of us uh, in our own uh, way, uh, we are simultaneously data producers as well as data users. And uh, we need to perhaps maintain a balance uh, between it. Uh, the second important uh, thing is uh, about uh, the biases uh, that this available data is creating, for example, bias against uh, women and girls if we don't have gendered data, bias against vulnerable segments of society if we don't have uh, data available to them. So uh, whatever baseline we have, uh, at times uh, it biases our decision and I think we need to perhaps uh, keep on using that time machine and try to see that what is it that we could have uh, done uh, better. Uh, and the third and most important, while all of us, uh, we uh, cherish uh, digital transformation and digitalization in uh, Pakistan. Uh, I think uh, one important fact that is highlighted by, I think, uh, uh, Wendy, uh, that is uh, the digital inequalities and digital inequities that exist uh, within uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, not only uh, the geographical, uh, on the geographical landscape, but also even sitting in Islamabad, we know that uh, there is a reasonable population uh, which perhaps don't have this access to 3G, 4G or other digital devices uh, that uh, we are yeah. using or we have the luxury to use them. And uh, perhaps as a, a development uh, uh, interventionist or development partners, uh, uh, you need to uh, uh, focus on the three things. Uh, one is uh, about uh, this uh, production of uh, evidences, uh, remove the biases in uh, uh, this uh, evidence production. Uh, second is uh, about uh, this uh, inequality and inequity that uh, work uh, with the, this uh, digitalization, try to uh, overcome that gap. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I really appreciated the idea that uh, while you have a donor coordination mechanism, perhaps uh, we also need to have a, a data coordination mechanism where the evidence is produced by all the development uh, partners. Uh, those can be uh, kept there either in public or uh, in confidential, but uh, I think we require uh, that sort of depository a repository of data uh, so that uh, the life of uh, data users, data producers uh, that can be facilitated. Thank you very much uh, for uh, all of uh, you who uh, joined the discussion. Uh, among the attendees, I can see we have around 52 
uh, participants who are still there, uh, uh, apart from those who are watching us live uh, on Facebook. Uh, we'll be bringing in our uh, closing plenary uh, at uh, four o'clock. Uh, and uh, in closing plenary, uh, we have uh, our uh, information minister, we have uh, uh, advisor uh, to Prime Minister on Climate Change, Malik Amin Aslam. So Shibli Faraz would be there, Information Minister would be there, and hopefully there would be a message uh, from Prime Minister uh, that would be there. So uh, the uh, mere uh, fact that uh, this meeting started uh, with uh, all of you and uh, uh, the Secretary General uh, SCO, uh, yesterday, uh, President of Pakistan, uh, he uh, re released his message for the delegates of this conference. And today we are uh, having uh, a prime minister's message. So that shows uh, that there is an appetite in government uh, to use uh, data uh, to uh, patternize uh, the organizations which can produce data. But of course, there are certain uh, cracks and certain loopholes, lacunas, uh, which we need to fill in while we focus on half-filled glass. We need to keep on pouring more water so the half empty glass also gets filled. Thank you very much uh, for joining me.